Welcome to the Foghorn and the Lunatics Live, episode 13. And I'm here with Olivia again. Fantastic. Oh, I'm, I'm glad you get excited every time I turn up. That's really wonderful. Here we are tonight. We're talking about tech startups and scale ups. Scale ups. So those startups that are successfully manipulating themselves to another space. Okay. It's like built the built blocks. The blocks. Getting so higher. come on inside. We're going to get kick this show off. And we're going. And thank you very much as well. We enjoy that well. Welcome to the hospitality of Newcastle and King Street here at the Foghorn Lunatics Live, episode 13, and we're going to get started. Thank you. And here we are at the Lunatics Live, talking to you from the coming to you from the brew house, King Street, Foghorn, of course. Of course, the Foghorn Brew House. I've got um, a, a foghorned out. No, no, not at all. And it's a fantastic atmosphere here on Tuesday night, having a great time. But what are we going to be talking about is... Tech startups and scale-ups. So not just starting up, Greg, we're scaling up and taking over the world with tech. And tech and all those other things. And however, one of our key compares or works with us. Chad is not here tonight. Yes, so unfortunately we won't be having Chad's section of Chad's tech news. So we'll have to improv there a little bit. I, I'm not a gamer, so you won't be hearing what the latest games are to play. Um, but maybe we'll be able to get Chad to do a Facebook post. But in however, the there's been a whole world of things happening. So one thing is that, uh, that little audio clip which is the computer generated. Is it Yanni or Yanni? It's definitely Yanni. No, no, I think it's Lani. <laughs> Does everyone know what we're talking about? What are we talking about, Greg? What are we talking about? I don't know. <laughs> and then it's, all oh, right. And then, of course, there's Google Duplex. Oh, yes, I uh, can't wait to get my haircut sorted out with the new Google booking system. Booking system. So, who are our wonderful guests joining us tonight? Oh, well, tonight it's really exciting. So, um, we've got four people speaking tonight. Um, first of all, we'll start with Martin Grimwald, um, who has, has been around the block a fair bit with, with tech and startups, and we'll be talking about um, his experience here in Newcastle compared to um, the work that he's done overseas in Europe. Uh, talking with Lloyd Davies, who is a part of Scrub It, a very exciting uh, tech startup that is now technically a scale up. Um, and we have Michelle O'Toole. Yeah, and that's that. Michelle and Peter Jameson um, will be talking to us also about their experience with Startup Express, which happened last week. And Michelle O'Toole is, is the business development manager at Crave. And we'll have a little clip to be playing and talking about what Crave is about. And then also Peter Jameson, who's the founder and director of Andetti, and is going to be talking about space or spatial mm. relations and Ooh. data. So Ooh. big, big data, big data sets, which is going to make for a really fascinating conversation mm. here tonight at the Foghorn Brew House here on King Street. So thanks very much for joining us to all our live crew out there and streaming at, uh, at the moment on Facebook and also Twitter and also through face, uh, YouTube. And Facebook. also Facebook, Facebook. And also we've got a great audience here as well who are joining us live from the Fog Court. Um, we'll, also, we'll also be talking a little bit about the Startup Express that happened, which was organised by the Business Centre here in Newcastle, which is a really great initiative and I can't wait to have a little chat about that. So thank you all for coming and um, we look forward to rolling through the night. So first up, let's invite Martin Grimland to join us up here on the panel. Martin, come on forward. Big round of applause. So, Martin, we're going to have to share the mic, mate. So, you know, if I pull it away from you, if you talk too much, yep. don't be offended, please. Right. Okay. So, so oh, sorry. okay, first up. So, Martin, what's, what's your story? What's your journey? And how is it that you're a part of the, tonight's session? Um, well, um, I moved here to Newcastle in October last year. Um, before that, I, I lived in London for three years. Uh, working in a startup there, um, and that startup went pretty well. We 
grew a startup from uh, 500,000 monthly active users to 50 million monthly active users. Um, and it's a, it was a game-based learning platform. Um, after three years, I, I worked really hard for three years. Um, and with my wife, we decided to move to Newcastle. And I, I stepped down a little bit to kind of uh, relax a little bit after that, those uh, pretty intense three years. Um, so that kind of brought me here, and then um, I've met with the uh, Newcastle Business Centre and spoken with them, and, and that's kind of how I've, I've uh, been invited here. Yeah. So why, why choose Newcastle to be your new home? Well, um, <laughs> well my, my wife's family lives in Singleton, um, so Newcastle is kind of the, the, the closest city to Singleton. Plus, um, coming from London... Um, we, we weren't really too keen on moving to Sydney. It was a bit too busy. Uh, you move, London is like a 10 million people. Before that, I lived in Lima in Peru, and that's 14 million or 12 million. So it was about time to come back to a little bit smaller city uh, where any travel is like one and a half hour. Um, so Newcastle was a pretty perfect place for that. It's, a, it's just a little bit uh, smaller than Oslo, which, you know, I feel right at home. So, yeah, it's pretty perfect. So is you're a native Oslo, are yeah. you? Yeah, native Oslo, yeah. So what's your background in terms of the whole tech area? Uh, well, I'm, uh, I'm a software developer, uh, and I've been in software development for 12 years and always kind of been in startups ever since I started. Um, so... Mostly in, I've been in a startup in, uh, in the States, in Boston, worked there for six months as an intern, um, and then um, worked in a, a few companies in, in Oslo at, uh, as a, at a startup as well, and then to Lima in London. So that's how, yeah. What is it that you like about working with startups? I think it's the, um, it's the pace and the, the challenges that you face. And also, if, you, if you're in a startup, you don't have a very specific defined role. Um, you have, everyone has to kind of pitch in, uh, um, pitch in to get the job done. Um, so I think for, for Kahoot, for instance, I, at some point I had to start up the office in Austin because, well, I was the one who needed a person in Austin. So, okay, I'm now managing an office in Austin. And there's like just stuff that you have to do because it's a startup and yeah, everyone has to do whatever needs to be done. So, yeah. so one of the things that always fascinates me about startups and the process that happens is that at what point do people fear or feel that it's going too fast and they have to get off the train? Or has that been your experience to date? Or is there a point where you think, no, nope, going to be in here all the way? Yeah, I think it's... Um, I, I don't think that it's... I haven't got the feeling that it's going too fast. It's more I've uh, gone as far as I want, kind of. It's, it's, uh, I've been able to reach what I wanted from the beginning. Um, in one startup that I worked in in Oslo, um, we, I worked in it for three years. The company started taking a different direction to what I really wanted. So then, for me, that was the time to to uh, find a, a different challenge, a new challenge. And first, for your wife, coming back here has, I guess, made a difference, close as a family. Is she in the tech industry as well? Yeah, um, she is in uh, UX design. So actually, that's how I met her. We, we met doing a, a project in Oslo. Um, and uh, yeah, so she's in the same industry. She actually worked in Kahoot as well with me. So yeah. So tell us a little bit about Kahoot and, and what is it about, what's the audience and, and where did it come from and where is it now? Um, well, Kahoot came from, it was a collaboration between um, four people in Oslo and London um, and it's a game-based learning platform. It's used a lot in education um, and so it was predominantly schools that would use the tool. Um, had a lot of users in, in the States. I think 80% of all students in the States have used Kahoot at some point. Um, I mean, I, I was visiting schools in the States and signing T-shirts. It, it was insane. Um, but the, 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 
it's a it's a game, so you have one uh, main screen that shows the game, and then you have multiple uh, devices connecting to that one game and interacting with that game. Um, so that's how the game works. Um, and yeah, it's it's used in learning, uh, both in education in schools and, and also in companies. So big companies use it as well. You know, um, so, so this is a, pro, a good example of gamification of learning to some extent, or? Um, I, think, I think gamification is a little bit, um, I, I try not to throw gamification around too much. Gamification means, for me, means you have a, a, a form and you try to make it fun by making it into a game. Kahoot was more a game from the ground up. We built a game that had uh, a pedagogy built into it to uh, maximize and make, maximize the learning learning effect of it. Um, I think the, the engagement that you got from a tool like that in education makes it, uh, makes it even more effective. So it, it was not a gamification as such, it's more it's based on a game, but taking advantage of that to achieve something within education. And then you, you went from that platform over to Human Perspective, is that right? Yeah, so human perspective is, is um, pretty recent. Um, so I, I came here to Australia in October uh, and to Newcastle in January. And the, for those who haven't uh, applied for the visa for uh, Australia, it's a bit of an effort. Um, so that took a long time. And then after that, um, I set up my own company here in, in Newcastle, and that's human perspective. Uh, and out of human perspective, I do mostly contract work. I do tech advisor, um, tech advisor roles in different startups, mostly within my network in, in London, Oslo, uh, working with a company in, in Sydney and one in, in Canada. Um, but that's mainly what I'm, I'm doing. And then I, I work on a few different concepts as well that I want to continue to work on. Um, as, as a software developer, building an application. Oh, wonderful. Um, so w what's your experience as you're, you're working with everyone, you're consulting, you're, you know, you're quite involved in the industry. What, what's your, have you noticed anything that, that is different between working in either Newcastle or, or, or Australia compared to working over in Europe? How is the tech world kind of functioning? Is there any difference? I think, um, well, I'm, I'm, uh, I, I don't have many months here in, in Newcastle. So, I mean, I'm, I, I've only been here for, what, four months. Um, so I haven't got a lot of experience in the startup scene here. I, I hope to get more experience and get more involved. Um, I do find um, Lon London is such a big city. So compared to London, the good thing about Newcastle is that it's, it's a very, it's a, tight community in a way like if you if you have an interest and you know someone else that has the same interest there will be a connection uh, whereas in London that's hopeless like if you, there's so many people that there's a there's a very little chance that you have a connection with that one person so that's a yeah. that's a good thing here it's very similar to Oslo that's it's um, it's the kind of a, a, a similar state in Oslo. So do you find the, um, the closeness, the proximity to others here in Newcastle could, you might not have done it yet, but that, that could potentially breed to more collaboration, open up new ideas and at least, if, if not collaborating, at least sharing, sharing ideas on, on how to do this or do that when it comes to marketing your business or building the business? Yeah. Um if I understood the question, I think uh, it definitely means that if, you, um, if you're in a community where it's easy to find people who have the same interest, maybe the same passion, um, and, and inspired to work on something together, it, it definitely has an amplifying effect. Um, so I think that's a, that's a good, um, it's definitely a very big positive uh, with Newcastle compared to London. London deals with that in a slightly different way. They have specialized um, groups of interest using Meetup, which is a service to kind of get people together over a certain topic. So they do that to still be able to have that kind of amplifying effect. But that's definitely one of the things that you'd see 
be yeah, amplifying those kinds of efforts in, in Newcastle. Now, one of the things, we're all about scaling up for the startups. Yep. So for yourself and your experience, what do you think are the key challenges trying to get startups to attract major investors or people are going to take you to that next level? Um, well, that's a difficult question. I think um, in my experience, it, the, the team is the most important thing. Uh, obviously, you need a good... You need a good idea, you need a good um, uh, whatever it is, idea that you're working on, but you also, at the end of the day, my experience, it's the team, it's the people in the company that the investors will invest in. Um, and what they trust is that you might not get it right the first time, second time, third time, fifth, tenth time, but that because they believe in the people in the company, they know that you will get it right eventually, or they, they think it's a good chance that you will get it right eventually. So from my perspective, it's, it's, the key is to have the right people. Yeah, keeping the right people together and supporting each other to make sure the best outcome is, is possible. Mm. Yeah? Yep. Oh, that's really wonderful. Um, Martin, that's all we have time for to chat about tonight. So thank you so much for coming on. Yep. Um, really, really glad that you have uh, moved to town and provided us with a new uh, knowledge base for startups. And, and it's wonderful to think that, you know, we're almost akin with Oslo. Perhaps we could do a sister city program. I, I, I was actually thinking that. We should try to do that, yeah. Okay. Well, we'll put you down that. So yeah. when you've got that happening, come and see us and we'll talk all about it. Yeah, we'll do that. Okay, thanks. Thank we're going to cut now to an ad break. Thanks so much. Thanks, Bob. Thanks. Yeah, of course, one of the great things about being in a co-working space is that there are others around you facing similar challenges at any particular time. So you're stuck on something, you're talking about it over coffee, someone makes a suggestion, you've got a different way of looking at things. But one of the strengths of 1804 being focused around a particular area, clean tech and smart cities, is that we're actually also dealing with very specific problems which are often closely related. And that creates a terrific opportunity. It amplifies the co-working experience. Your colleagues have no reason to jealously guard their own position. Um, there's no competition aspect, there's no um, uh, political games of uh, I'm going to be promoted above you so I'll, I'll undermine you. And so uh, everyone goes to these um, unfamiliar extents to, to help each other out because we're all in the same game. You know, if, if, uh, if we do well then our colleagues do well and if our colleagues do well then we do well. So it's a, it's a real cohesion. It's a focused co-working space in that we work with that residents are building scalable product-based startups and we're looking to address global markets. It's focused around a particular vertical, that's clean tech and smart cities. Um, we think that's important because it's really a differentiator for this region. It's a big problem facing the world, it's a solution to be solved for the future. Welcome back to the Foghorn here at Lunatics Live, episode 13. And we're talking about startups and scale up. But uh, joining us on the panel here is going to be Lloyd Davies. And Lloyd is the co founder of Scrub It, which is a fascinating uh, app that actually helps manage the process in the, the operating theatre. So, welcome. Thank you very much for joining us here. Thanks, Rick. Thanks very much. So, tell us, what is it about Scrub It that really gets you excited every time you? Uh, go and try to pitch it to somebody? Um, I think like all people in software and a development background, it's solving a problem. So uh, there's quite a large problem in the operating theatre around preparing setups and preparing them accurately and in a timely fashion. And uh, Scrub It's a great solution for doing that. So although I come from a development background, I didn't know anything about health or operating theatres, it's still just solving a problem. And I think like Martin, we just... You know, we're just passionate about solving problems with tech because we know we can. And, uh, that, yeah, that's really the main thing that I like to do is just solve people's problems. And this is a really big problem that I think we've solved really well. What's the, what's the impact that this problem solving has had in the industry? Um, we're still measuring a lot of it. You mentioned before we're in a scale-up phase. I think you're saying that only because of timing. Health is very slow, so I, uh, I don't feel we're quite there yet. 
Um, but um, just imagine, you know, you're on the operating table. Um, during your, your operation, it's more than likely that the scrub nurse will spend about two and a half minutes of that time that you're under out of the operating theatre to go and get something that's been missed. So um, by reducing that down to under, under a second on average per operation, you know, we've been able to make a dramatic um, improvement to the qu quality of operations. Um, obviously the surgeons are happier because they're not getting delayed in the work that they're doing, which is obviously very integral and um, it's expensive and it's time driven. Um, but also then of course there's a lot of impact around that on saving of equipment and, and, uh, and such in um, making sure that they're not wasting um, items that are very expensive. So um, there's a lot of time and cost savings around it, but there's just a lot of quality of um, uh, job satisfaction for all of the stakeholders around it that, that's really important, especially when you're the patient on the table, you want a happy team working on you. Absolutely. So with all that in mind, given your background, where did Scrub It come from? What was the, uh, the catalyst for it? So Scrub It was the brainchild of Beth Wozniak, one of our co-founders, and she's a scrub. And uh, she, she came out of uh, university, um, went into scrubbing and realised that this process of doing setups was completely manual. And it's the scrub's job to make sure that it's right. So someone else is doing the job and then they had to check it. And the amount of mistakes she, she found in that process is quite astronomical. And the scrubs just cover it up. And she's being a millennial, she wasn't happy with that. She wasn't satisfied with that. So she went looking for a solution. And it just so happens that her mother and I had built software previously in disability services. We've had a relationship for over 10 years doing software together and um, worked together very well professionally to the point that um, we're friends after that, or, or after all those jobs finished. So naturally, we just made an introduction and uh, we took it from there. I, I took it away and um, investigated the problem further. I didn't believe the problem existed. I certainly hoped it didn't. And um, uh, so I went and did my validation around what was going on and realised it actually was a problem, not just here, but it's worldwide. So, um, yeah, we took it on from that point. So it was best idea um, that she brought to us to try and solve together. Yeah, yeah right. Uh, well, I, I'm interested in the evolution of, of how it's gone from, from the inception and then you guys started and, and where you're at now. Can you tell us a little bit about that journey? Yes, sure. So um, we obviously uh, went away and you know worked out what the problems were. We were very lucky that Beth's employer, we went through a process there initially of getting approved to go into their operating theatre. So we had a live environment in which we could build and test our product. But we did a lot of that after hours, weekends, when no, there were no operations going on. Um, but we did have access to the, to the environment, which was extremely important from many, many aspects, as simple as you're in a concrete bunker, so there's only Wi-Fi in the hallways. So at the moment you go into a storeroom or a stock room, you lose Wi-Fi, things like that. Really obvious things once you know about them, but not obvious as a software developer who expects just to have access to data all the time. Um, so uh, we, we built up our MVP, which we then took um, on site at that hospital. Um, at Maitland Private in uh, a, a healthy care hospital and uh, we started testing it with the people there. We picked a few key stakeholders who we knew were open to uh, the idea that were positive about the, the idea of working with us and uh, we obviously iterated quite a bit from that point until we actually went live. It probably took us, um, there was a, a good four months from our, our first product to a go live product and that was over 18 months ago now so we've made quite a lot of change to the product in that time. The journey for Scrub It then has been trying to get some more validation. Uh, we went into the Slingshot HCF Catalyst program, uh, did a lot of work in there about validating our idea and our product. Um, it became quite evident that in the health space we really needed um, that corporate support to make it happen. It's very difficult as a brand new idea no matter how good it is to get any traction. Um, there's a lot of stakeholders in this space, from, from CEOs to scrubs, to the people that do the setup, um, to the patient, to the doctor, and we have to find all of the triggers that make them want scrub it. And um, some people are scared by that because it'll take away, they, well, they think it'll take away their job rather than helping them do it better. So we've had to identify all those things. So we've been working on creating some um, corporate relationships as well. 
Um, we're currently talking to uh, medical supply companies because they know the problem is, exists, but they also have their own problems in the same space. So we're commercialising the product. We're looking to commercialise the product in conjunction with them as well and get a bit of clout, let's say, rather than just being a small startup. Because this is what you mentioned the slowness of taking up and corporate, both public and private. But what's been the what's been the experience of getting across that line? At what point do they see the value of what you're saying? Yeah, well, Greg, that's that's kind of what I'm saying. Everybody's value proposition in what we're doing is very different. Um, so the person on the ground sees the value because they can do a better job. The doctor sees the value, or the surgeon sees the value because. There's no delays, same with scrubs. The nurse unit manager sees delays because she's not got um, taxis driving all around Newcastle delivering items that have been missed or forgotten. So everybody's got different triggers and that's, that's been a real challenge for us because we've solved the problem but we've got to make sure we're solving the trigger for the decision and, and that's really different and that's why we believe um, by partnering with someone that sort of understands those triggers a little bit more, has triggers of their own and therefore can, let's say, uh, have, a little, yeah, have a little bit more clout in that space over um, integrating their offering with our offering to make it happen. That's been um, really important for us in the health space, let's say. <laughs> I, I, my my personal question for you is: How do you keep going? How do you how do you keep your uh, motivation going to persist to the end? Uh, it's really difficult at times. I must admit, it, it's a very emotional journey. You spend a lot of time, a lot of a lot of your own energy, a lot of your own money, a lot of time away from family. I'm not getting any younger, so it's um, that that's really difficult. Um, so you need the support of everybody to make that happen. Um, how do you keep going? I think we believe we've, we've got the um, inception of a really good product that can really make a difference um, to a big problem. We just need, I think we're just still looking for the right triggers in that space to make it explode. Yeah. I mean, how many times did you actually have to pitch this to get that traction, you know, getting it across the line, so to speak? Uh, you talk like that's in the past. Um, <laughs> Uh, lots. So, and, and um, you know, I, I always say startups are the new court jesters. You know, we, they roll them out as entertainment at all sorts of events, and you, you you have to pick it up because, in fact, one of the relationships we've got going on was picked up because I was asked to pitch in an event, which you wouldn't expect anybody to see you at. There was a gentleman in the crowd that had a neighbour that had told him about the problem that they had and he was able to make the connection between us and a multinational company. That was just by pitching in Newcastle in Watt Street one evening. And so you've, you've got to keep rolling it out. And I think the pitch is really important because no matter if it's just the thought of an idea, if you can communicate the pitch really well, people have a perception of you. So if you're starting at a much higher level, they take it from there and forward. They're not starting at this low level of, oh, it's a good idea, but... You know, they're kind of going, no, we're really confident in you. And to mirror what Martin said, they're, they're really confident in the per people behind the product. So no matter what the product is, they believe that you can offer it and you can represent it. And um, so your pitch gives you the chance to do all of those things um, and you just have to take all those opportunities as they arise. I've heard that the best way to learn how to pitch is to pitch to everyone. So everyone you meet on the street, or your neighbour, just just always pitch and then you will refine over time the best way to say it in that really succinct way. Yeah, that, that's very true. It's practice, practice, practice and I think the best way, the only way to practice is in front of people because practising in a mirror you can make mis like, it's, not, it's definitely not the same. In my younger years I was a musician so I played on stage a lot and I see it very much the same way. You take on a persona and you go out there and nail it. So even if you're not a confident person you need to look people in the eye and make them believe in you. So it's really important um, to be able to communicate that message really clearly. Yeah. Hence your analogy to the court jester. Yes, exactly. Yeah, it's very much like that sometimes. Um, here at the Lunatics Live, we believe that tech is an enabler. Um, and I like to, you know, jovially say, how does that tech save my life or better my life? Um, I'd, I'd like to hear from you, like, you know, we're talking about the pitch. Like, from, like here, how, how does your app save someone's life or better someone's life? Well, it's like I said earlier, the, the, 
the main uh, thing that it betters someone's life is by helping someone do a better job. So no matter if you employ people, we all like to think um, people are working for us out of the goodness of their heart. They're not. They're working for them. Okay? So if they're able to go to work and do a better job, they can go home happier. So if you can give them a tool that helps them do a better job, I believe that's a really good thing. And that's, what, that's the main aim of Scrub It, is to do a better job. So we've got scrubs, we've got the people collecting the setups, we've got the surgeons, we've got the nums, and therefore we've got the management of the, of the um, hospitals, etc., going up the tree. They're all doing a better job because Scrub It's doing its job. Um, but of course, if we can keep the staff in the room and we can keep a surgeon doing the operation without delay, I, I like to think we're bettering the lives of the patient as well. So with all this effort, what's the future? I'm not sure, I'll be honest. Um, we're open to anything. Uh, we're open to whatever direction it takes us. Um, uh, we, we'd really like to see Scrub It as the, the, you know, the assumed application within operating theatres. If you don't have Scrub It, what are you doing sort of thing. There is huge opportunity overseas because this problem is global, surprisingly. Um, and you know, we, we really believe we've got the right product. Uh, Tech-wise, it's set up ready to go globally, so it's really about just commercialising it. So the short-term future is about finding the partners to help us commercialise it. Uh, you know, Long-term, we'd really like to see taking it into overseas markets once we put, get Australia out of the way. Well, thank you very much. Thanks, this is fantastic. Thanks for joining us, Lloyd. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thanks. And we'll uh, cross to another ad break. Thank you. Yeah, of course, one of the great things about being in a co-working space is that there are others around you facing similar challenges at any particular time. So you're stuck on something, you're talking about it over coffee, someone makes a suggestion, you've got a different way of looking at things. But one of the strengths of 1804 being focused around a particular area, clean tech and smart cities, is that we're actually also dealing with very specific problems which are often closely related. And that creates a terrific opportunity. It amplifies the co-working experience. Your colleagues, have no reason to jealously guard their own position. Um, there's no competition aspect, there's no um, uh, political games of uh, I'm going to be promoted above you, so I'll, I'll undermine you. And so uh, everyone goes to these um, unfamiliar extents to, to help each other out, because we're all in the same game. You know, if, if, uh, if we do well, then our colleagues do well, and if our colleagues do well, then we do well. So it's a, it's a real cohesion. It's a focused co-working space in that we that residents are building scalable product-based startups and we're looking to address global markets. But it's focused around a particular vertical, that's clean tech and smart cities. Um, we think that's important because it's really a differentiator for this region. It's a big problem facing the world, a solution to be solved for the future. to Lunatics Live, episode 13, here at the Foghorn Brewhouse. Today, Greg, we're talking about tech startups and scale-ups. So we're also going to, join us up here in the panel, is going to be is Michelle O'Toole, and she is the Business Development Manager at Crave, and also Peter Jameson, who's the Founder and Director of Andetti, which is all about spatial data, or manipulating it, by working within the environmental space. But our guests up here are actually part of the team that went down with the, the bus, was the Startup Express bus. There, and they actually pitched at the Ernst & Young uh, session down there in Sydney last week. And we have a short little uh, piece we would like to play just to give you a context of what happened down there on that particular evening. Going the live stream. With the CEO of Inner Pursuit, who's going to welcome us tonight. Catherine, why are you here tonight with us? Thank you, Pierre. Look, um, I, I would say it's got a lot to do with what we're trying to achieve within Her Pursuit. 
Uh, it's all about networking, collaboration, and then driving commercial outcomes from those collaborations. And really, that's what this entire night's about, isn't it? Bringing together some five-star startups that have got incredible traction, amazing teams, and great tech, and introducing them to a throng of investors um, that hopefully will network and collaborate and produce a commercial outcome with them. You're really talking about investing, eh? Absolutely, so we, I'm talking about investing. Money. We want money, but more of it, I mean, very interestingly, is we, it's a collective of a lot of um, co-working spaces, the University of Newcastle, the Business Centre, of course, which is a non-vested, non-for-profit organisation supporting innovation and startups. And that's how we already work together with Catherine together. You've already been there with us Absolutely. for a pitch night. Yeah, the Startup House 100 was a fantastic experience as well. And I've certainly made a lot of valuable connections from that experience. But then also uh, got to really understand the, the embryonic environment that you guys are creating at Newcastle Business Centre. Um, got so excited by what you guys are doing up there that I really feel excited that we can bring all of that knowledge and all of that passion and motivation and start letting it you know, infiltrate into the way that we run things in Sydney as well. Absolutely. Well, if you watch this video tonight, if you're keen to invest, get in touch. Catherine Sforcina in her pursuit, Pierre Malou, the Business Centre. Thank you. See you. So there you had to give you a bit of context of what happened for our two panelists up here joining us, our guests, uh, Peter and Michelle. But uh, perhaps you may have sh wanted to come and film it at the Falkhorn, perhaps, the, the, the food scenes. We probably should have. We will next edit. <laughs> <laughs> now, that was the Ernst & Young pitching, and that was for regional startups down there. So, so uh, Michelle, I'll just start with you first. Um, from where you sit, what's, what does that opportunity afford your organisation to be able to do that in that space without all this of hype about Sydney and etc. But I mean beyond that, is there a real value in doing that and going down there? Absolutely. I mean firstly uh, in terms of the opportunity being exposed to attending the event we have to say a, a huge thank you to Pierre Gordon and the team from the Business Centre for uh, including us in, in the event last week. Um, just to be a part of the group of, of startups and, and understanding the challenges that we're all facing together um, and just collaborating and sharing ideas and sharing the pain points and sharing all the different um, experiences that we're going through was a terrific chance for us to kind of value validate that we are on the right track and, and we are doing things um, the right way and sometimes we will make mistakes but it's all about learning and moving on from that so um, you know to be exposed I guess in that forum but also to be exposed in the Ernst & Young pitch session was incredible just to just to have that experience of being in a room presenting to um, as you know sophisticated investors and and VCs when we're still so early on in, in our stage of the business was was terrific. Um, we heard that you had quite a successful um, session down there. Um, the founder of, of your app, um, Jessica, I hear, is also on a, on a cool tech show this evening. Um, can you tell us about that? 
She sure is. She really, really, really wanted to be here, um, but surprise to Jess and myself uh, on the, the Ernst & Young pitch night last Tuesday was Catherine from In Her Pursuit, who is a, a passionate uh, advocate for female founders in the tech startup space. And she surprised Jess uh, to appear live on a panel of Sky News tonight on the Entrepreneur Show. So Jess is in Sydney at the moment as we speak on the show. Doing Sky Thank News. You. Well, <laughs> hey, look, uh, you're d holding up the other side, you know? I two am. Two pillars. That's right. Two pillars. <laughs> it's a team effort. So, so Michelle, uh, Crave, we, we've seen what appears to be a food app, but what is Crave? Yes, so, so Crave uh, was developed in August last year uh, by Jess, the founder and the agency director. Uh, a bit of background, Crave is a social media marketing agency based in Newcastle and we uh, specialise in the hospitality industry. So our team have, have a lots of experience in dealing with restaurants and cafe owners um, and we understand the challenges that they have in marketing their business and obviously the budgets um, and the, the, the constraints around time and, and obviously knowledge in the marketing space. So uh, hence the Crave app was born, which is a, it's a visual dish-based discovery tool where people can personalise their filters based on where they are in terms of location, price, dietary requirements and different times of meal types, so breakfast, lunch and dinner. And basically images of food comes up on their screen, a little bit like Tinder for food, swiping left and right on the concept of the app. And if you like what you see, you click through and that takes you through to where the dish is from, how close it is to you. Uh, and then the consumer can obviously act on that based on the visual, um, visual view of food. And we also have thousands of offers on there as well, so people can save lots of money um, when they're travelling not only locally but um, uh, as a tourist as well. Yeah. So it's a bit like the entertainment book to some extent, yes, and yeah. sort of taking that but into a digital space. Absolutely, and more visual. So visual is crucial. It's all about the food. So from a business's point of view, the, the chefs love it because they get to showcase the valuable and amazing creations that they, they you know, present in their dishes and their food. So um, from a business's point of view, uh, it allows them to showcase what they present on the plate rather than reviews and a description based on the business. Um, so you guys just launched in 2017, so you're quite young as a, as a business, but you're getting quite good traction. Can you just tell us about starting, starting up and, and, and the kind of, again, the journey that you've got to, to now, anything that you've learnt along the way? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I joined the team at the end of last year. Uh, as I mentioned, Jess is the founder and the, the brains behind the app. Uh, the app was actually developed, it's a very, very family-based uh, business, so the app was actually developed by Jess's brother, um, which obviously allowed us to be able to develop at a, a much cheaper price than it would be as a normal app development cost. Uh, and it allows us to make changes uh, a lot quicker and a lot more fluidly um, because we have access to, to tech um, very quickly. Uh, so I came on board at the end of last year and it, it's really interesting because my background is working with restaurants and cafes with the industry advocate restaurant and catering and a background of hotels, restaurants and marketing um, side of things. So to come into a startup was a real interesting eye-opener for me to see the different challenges that, that startups face. Um, you're doing everything with not much money at all. So you're an expert in HR, finance, sales, marketing and everything. So it's a real collaborative approach. It's a real, um, you know, all hands on deck and, and I think it's really important. I know everyone keeps saying the team is really crucial. If you like what you're doing, if you love the people you're working with and you're passionate about the idea, um, the sky's the limit. So which is probably a good point to, to bring Peter in because your long experience being an entrepreneur but also dealing in the area of environmental engineering uh, and so forth but at the same time the whole startup environment what what's that been like for you in that respect it's actually been an interesting transition i started up my first company probably 25 years ago when startup didn't exist or the term didn't exist um, the transition into the startup we have now has basically occurred over the last eight years or thereabouts we started solving problems in environmental space that were big data problems, things like flood modelling where it was far too complex for people to look at. And we worked out that if we're going to do this properly, it needs to be done much more efficiently than, going, you know, than the way it's been going forward. And so it's been a bit of a transition. I'm an engineer and I'm a dot joiner more than anything else. I see how things fit together. But I have a lot of really smart people that work with me 
that help us actually put that into a smooth space. And if I had to explain what we do, it's a little bit like, well, I'll use oil as a bit of an analogy in this space. So Peter Sondergaard from Gartner last year basically said that oil is the, sorry, data is the oil of the future. In actual fact, data is the energy of the future. And our job is to take that raw data, a bit like oil, find it in the first place, then curate it, actually get it clean, refine it, and then produce some really high quality products from it. But that's where the analogy with oil stops because our next job then is to serve it as lightly as we can straight to a user, their car, or directly into the engine that's driving them, i.e. their business going forward. And that's basically what we're working on doing, if that's not too complex. No, that's... That's beautifully explained. Thank you. Um, no, you, you were involved in Startup Express last week. You're quite experienced in the industry. So how did you find the experience of being in that program? Yeah, that was quite interesting. The Ernst Young pitch was even more interesting in that space. Um, we've done one-on-one -on -one pitches many times over the last X number of years. But to pitch to a group that you don't know who they are, there's a hundred odd people there that are interested, but at what level do they understand? It becomes really quite challenging and interesting in that space. What we have to pitch is not what we call simple in that space, so trying to put it across in a way was a real challenge. We spent a long time thinking about it, and I think for me, the major learning out of all that was actually the thought and the clarity we got in coming to terms with what we were going to try and deliver in that pitch space. But it's quite interesting trying to put it into a six and a half minute time frame. But that could only help you market your product better by refining it down to its most simplest piece of, you know, elocution for, for, for the general user. That can only be a benefit to you. Ab absolutely. So at work, each week we, or each fortnight, we run an agile, learn an agile process. And each fortnight we catch up on what worked and what didn't in the last week. And this week we actually scored how we thought the last two weeks were. Now I actually gave it a nine. Half the week I was in bed with the flu because I was as sick as a dog when I was delivering this presentation down to Ernst Young. But the nine was because we got so much clarity out of our process that it was probably the most productive fortnight that I've had in a long time in that space. And it was the pressure of the pitch or the getting it to that state that really helped us get to that point. We've worked in probably 30 different market verticals. We've provided solutions, apart from the environmental stuff, in all sorts of areas that need scalable solutions that are a bit bespoke or a bit whatever else. We now serve up information to solar industry guys and we serve it up to property industry. We worked out the other day we're saving one of our clients about half a million a year because we're providing the information they need directly in front of them rather than them having to go to find it in that space. So it's, you know, it's been quite an experience, yes. So explain to us exactly what it is that NDT does. You've just saved someone half a million dollars. I'm, I'm, I'm interested to know. Can it help me? Okay, so we work with, this is, and I'm going to try and make it as simple as I possibly can, we work with spatial data, spatial information. So if you think about Google and you look at Google Earth and you look at the images that are there, that, Im that, that information contains a lot more than just what you see with your eye. And you can start to drill down into that information and find out where there are curbs and where there are different species in that space, etc. And we can actually pull that out. We combine that with, a th with those images with a thing called LIDAR. So when a policeman picks you up for travelling too fast, he shot a laser beam at you. He can work out exactly where you are in space. We can do the same with aircraft, helicopters, satellites, other bits and pieces, and work out exactly what something looks like. We then start to build analytics on all that. We start to analyse that data. So the building guys that we, we just say we save about half a million dollars a year for, they used to drive to site to look at what the neighbours' houses looked like, to look at where the trees were, to find out where the fire hydrants were, to find roof pitches and all those things. We just serve that up to them on their computer screen because we can analyse it to that level. Okay. Okay. So, in mindful of your background, many years of entrepreneurial spirit, what of that experience has supported you in terms of moving to this next stage with the startup and then scaling up? Look, if at all. Uh, no, lots. So I spent the last 25 years or thereabouts working with clients and the community trying to make the most out of the resources we have to fire the community we live in, we live in all right? And we've done a lot of work in that space, but the realities come or the, under, so the 
yeah, understanding has come that it's not just the resources. We need to think about how we use them in a much more clever way going forward. And I can give you a few examples in that space. If you go back to a Cobb & Co coach back in the turn of the century, you'd use six horses and probably four weeks to take 20 kilos of letters or 200 kilos of letters and four people to Armadale, say, all right? You'd use about 800 kilowatt hours of power. You'd generate about 800 kilograms of CO2, of, of gas. Nowadays, or oh, sorry, the next transition from that was technology, fossil fuel cars. You cut the travel time down to four hours, you cut the greenhouse gas emission down to about half, and you cut the energy consumption down to about a quarter of what it was, what it was used otherwise. Nowadays, using technology, data, we press a button, an email gets sent or a, a PDF gets sent or something else, does all that information. Doesn't necessarily transfer the people, but it transfers the information across going through it. And that is sort of the analogy that we're seeing we have to do. At this point in time, we're about seven times over the global renewable footprint of energy usage. If we don't get smarter about how we use what we've got, then we're just not going to be here. And that's what it's about. Wow, that's really amazing. So you're basically gathering data from everything, you know, like in order to in order to refine the process on how to work with it in, 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 in multiple industries. Yeah, so 25 years of doing environmental consulting covered a lot of ground yeah. and we have a good understanding. I've worked with other people in that space. One of the guys, our head of technology, has been with me 20 years, basically. So we understand what the information needs to look like. We'll go and look and find that information and make sure it's fit for purpose, as we say. It's the right resolution, right quality, etc., etc. And then we'll analyse it to produce the results that we need. So, yes, it's... Yeah. Oh, that's really great. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Michelle, I'd, I'd like to just step back and talk about um, uh, the Startup Express. And, and Peter just said that it, it, it helped him a lot in, in um, the articulation of, of what it is that, that um, his company is doing. Did that process um, also work for you? Did you receive any extra benefits that you weren't expecting? Absolutely. I think it's just the exercise of you know the product so well, you know it inside out, but how can you communicate that not just uh, by words but also by feeling as well and, and to, to have people really understand and be engaged and feel like they're living it with you. So um, we, you know, Jess and I practiced the pitch over many, 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 many hours um, and we were find it over, you know, three or four, five, six different times in different formats. So it really, I think, um, it just makes you sort of step back and have a look at the way you're doing business and even from this process it allowed us to look at our pricing model and where we're going to move in the next phase and how we plan to scale up and, and what that looks like. Mm -hmm. So just really taking a step back and um, you're so entrenched in the day-to-day -day that you don't have much time to really think about the long-term strategy even though you know what you, wh where you want to go. It's just taking a step back and working through um, and getting feedback from a lot of different stakeholders and people involved. Yeah. Yep. Uh, Peter, um, I believe there's some great work that you're doing overseas, in South Africa. Central America. Central America. Uh, yeah, yeah. You want to hear that story? Well, <laughs> just yeah, because uh, prior to coming on, uh, we were listening to some people talking about that. So I'd be very interested to hear what's going on there. So one of the things we do is a lot of work with LiDAR, which is this laser beam stuff. And we've written our own classification system for it. It's probably one of the best ones in the world that we're sort of using going through that space. We got approached by a company out of Western Australia who had a project in Central America. And there's a major infrastructure project being built there. It's about 5,500 kilometres squared, mostly of dense forest, but lots of houses through the area, lots of people, lots of drainage lines and all that sort of stuff. They'd engaged an American firm to capture LiDAR over the whole site so they could build what we call a digital terrain model, a surface of the earth in that space and work out what height it was and put contours on it and all that stuff. And then also to be able to pull out where there were buildings and drainage lines from that. Now, it turns out that that American company had one or two challenges while they were there because the planes that they were using to capture the LiDAR were pretty much the same size as ones that carry other white stuff like cocaine. And one of them landed one day with a few bullet holes in it. And so they weren't so keen to go back again after that. They also found that when they were putting, we put control points down on the ground so that we can measure and relate everything back to those control points. But the surveyors were being faced by gorillas not gorillas with hairiness, but the gorillas with submachine guns. And they lost some of their equipment, etc. So they ended up delivering the data to our clients 
and saying, that's it. And they wouldn't give them the raw data or anything else, that's it. So our client has spent $1.5 million collecting this data for no result. Or the result they got was a mess, they couldn't use it. So we, in our, with our system, the way it's been set up, went back to the sort of fundamentals of the data capture. So an aeroplane flies across, it has time. It's shooting things at an angle. We can work out from time and an angle where it should have hit on the ground. And then we can actually start to piece together all that information. So there was about 50 billion of these points shot down that we had to go back and realign and resort and work through and then recollate the whole thing. And then when we got the data, there were some errors in the data itself. So normally an error bar in the data we're working with might be only about 200 mils or so. In this stuff, it was more like 600 to 800 millimetres. And so trying to find a plane or a roof for a building became impossible. So we had to rewrite our code that we developed over six or seven years specifically for this data to try and find the roofs that were out there. And then we basically sat down and generated all that information, put it all back together and delivered it back to the client. We didn't get 1.5 million, unfortunately, but we got a very happy client. <laughs> but wouldn't you just go to Google Maps and bring that up? <laughs> Sorry, it's being facetious. No, no, it's a very valid question, because what's the difference between us and Google Maps? All right? Google Maps, you can see something. It looks like it's a building in 3D. It looks like it's real. But that's about where it ends. Okay? We can tell you precisely where the gutter, the roof pitch, the tower on the top of it is. And we can tell you when, when they put imagery together, you never know whether it's actually in the right spot or not. But when you put imagery and LIDAR together, you very rapidly work out that they're mismatched by some metres. And one of our clients was telling us that they were achieving 200 millimetres horizontal alignment with their imagery. It was very good. Wow. We found out it was a long way short of that. And we just produced some imagery back to them and showed them exactly that's where it's at. So yeah, the other difference is we can interrogate our stuff and tell you all sorts of more information. So in the remaining couple of minutes we have, uh, I'd just like to get some feedback from both of you briefly. What have you gained out of being a part of the Express and where do you go from here? So, Michelle. Well, I guess, um, firstly, some, I'd call it great friends. You know, we've, we've made some amazing connections in the last week um, that has been invaluable to our business. Um, just even to, to be aware of the the resource of the business centre to be able to have access to um, you know, financial experts, uh, legal experts. We're basically bootstrapping the business at the moment so we don't have much money to spend. So um, I think that the whole exercise for us has been a terrific chance to take a step back in, in the whole scheme of things and really work out where we want to go and how we're going to get there and push ourselves to set some really critical deadlines um, to launch into particularly the metro areas within the next sort of six to 12 months. Peter? Part of us is support, and we moved into 1804 to be part of our community and to help Newcastle grow. I've said this a couple of times before, but Newca Newcastle really amazes me about the collaborative effort, the community, the sense of community that's here, and I think it's a great place to be part of going, future, going forward into the future. And that was the Ernst Young and the um, Siebert sort of visit was just one more trip on that journey. But yeah, it's about getting good, camera good camera camaraderie <laughs> sorry, and yeah, good exposure. Well, look, a like round of applause to our two guests, Michelle and Peter. Thanks for joining us up here. Fascinating. Really appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. So we're here from the Foghorn, episode 13, Lunatics Live. And we've got a couple of things that we'd like to know everyone about. We've got the Newey Awards. Yes, the, um, the Newey Awards are on in September on the 27th, which is very exciting. It's our big event of the year. Um, and entries close on the 17th of August. So get, get your entries in and let's have a really great, successful night on the uh, 27th of September. And because the, the first round of judging will be on the, 20, the 24th of August, Fitness, the, the finalists will be announced on the 7th of September and then the actual award ceremony, 27th September, here at the Foghorn Brewhouse here on Newcastle 
uh, in Newcastle on King Street. Will you be here, Greg? I definitely will. Will you, Olivia? Oh, I think I might come. Absolutely. Sounds wonderful. So, to all of our crew, thank you very much for a fantastic audience here. To our wonderful panellists and guests who joined us up here, Lunatics Live, episode 13, Start Up and Scaling Up. Thank, thank you very so much. Thank you very much for joining, and bye-bye for now. Good night. <laughs>